I'm going to have to implement this new structure to the program from now on. Danny, good morning. Welcome into the show. You're on your own. Uh, so, uh, so, so Danny, what, lock up when you're done because yeah. we're all finished here now. Danny, Danny, what he's saying is that I, and in this case, John Doyle, are just a pretty face. We don't say anything, just oh, be a pretty on. face. <laughs> and if anybody will believe that, there will be problems. Yeah, pull that mic closer to you, Danny, so Sorry. we can hear you. There you go. Sorry. Hey, welcome back. Well, it's always good to be here. Danny specializes in elder care law in the uh, area, and uh, your name came up recently in a conversation I had with a person. I won't say who the person's name was, but you got to tell me whether this is possible. So uh, let's say that you have uh, in your family met another adult of legal age, of course, mm -hmm. but uh, they are not necessarily with all their faculties. Okay. Right? Uh, but they're not a harm to anybody at this time. Okay. Can you get power of attorney over that person? That's going to be a tough question because... Bring that uh, mic a little closer to yep. still. So what happens is, uh, does does the financial institutions honor that? Because uh, a lot of them will say, well, that person was not competent. If we can get a doctor to say that they are competent, I'm going to use it. You know, because a power attorney is so important for protecting assets for anybody and taking care of them. Mm -hmm. And and if you don't get the power of attorney, then you got to get the guardian conservatorship. Now you're involved in court. Now you got to get a, an, another attorney involved. Um, you know, to protect the interest of the protected person. But again, your what you've outlined there, I would try to use that power of attorney. I would just because uh, it, it, just to protect that person. You're not harming that person. Mm -hmm. You're protecting their assets. You're protecting how you care for them. Uh, again, you're not hurting anybody in any way whatsoever. So it's you worth know. pursuing the power of attorney in a situation like that, at least to pursue it. Yeah, because Rob, here's the point. Again, let's go to a guardian conservatorship, and, and it, it's okay to do that. But if if you do that. And then you want to sell real estate or transfer real estate so that they're not over resourced to get any public benefits. Then you got to go to court. You got to get the court's approval. That could take 90 days, uh, even longer, and and you could lose a lot of money. And and again, if 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 you're doing it and it's uh, on the edge, I I would say we're going towards getting that power of attorney created. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and and so. Just since you brought that up, because I've got other things I want to talk about. Sure. But I always say power of attorney is one of the critical documents you can have. Because uh, several things you want is, is you want a gifting paragraph in that power of attorney. We've talked about that before. It's kind of talking, rehashing some of the things. But again, if, if a person is sick, um, they're starting to decline. We can, for example, let's take the home place. You don't want that home place to be subjected to uh, uh, recovery, losing that home place, which you've you know, used your money all your life to, to buy that place, to build it up. And, and we can do what is called a transfer on death deed to protect that, that house. And, and there's certain ways to do it. But you want that gifting paragraph in there. What you're saying is it's okay for my loved ones to move my assets out of my name into their name or some other name as a means of protecting those assets for me. For, for example, you know, again, if, if uh, you've got a loved one, uh, mom and dad. Dad, I'm again, I always pick on men because we men are the weaker sex. <laughs> so, so, so the point being is, 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 um, Dad goes into the hospital in today's world. You're in, in the hospital for three days. Now you're out to a nursing home. You know, that could be ten to $15,000 per month. Very few people can afford that. But with a husband and wife, with the power of attorney, mom can buy what is called a Medicaid qualified annuity. And with the Medicaid qualified annuity, I've just protected all the assets. I mean, for goodness sakes, why wouldn't you not want to do that if you can? And, and, and so that's why a power of attorney is so critical. Even a single individual, we can protect all the assets. Uh, say, for example, mom is now surviving. Uh, she has no one to care for. Her. She has declined to the point where she's got dementia. Now we can put her, uh, you, nobody wants to go to a nursing home. That's the last resort, obviously. Right, yeah. But if she does go to the nursing home, we can buy what is called a life insurance policy. It's a term policy. I can protect all the assets. But again, I need that power of attorney that allows mm -hmm. me to do that. 
And and in that power of attorney, now come on, guys, you got to start asking me questions because I'm worried. <laughs> <laughs> We're waiting for you to finish, Danny. <laughs> we do not interrupt Danny. <laughs> so, 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 but again, with the power of attorney, you've got to put specific powers in there that allows us to buy a life insurance policy and to change beneficiaries or to appoint beneficiaries, you know, in in that life insurance policy right. under the new format danny the next question is yours <laughs> yes sir <laughs> so, so it, it, since we're talking a little bit about nursing homes and and, and uh, i can say we have really good nursing homes in the area i mean they, they really do try to help people and, and they try to assist people but one of the things that you have to be careful of is in the application process is they'll ask do you want to uh uh, go for arbitration and not have the right to go to trial. So if mom's been abused in a way that she's fallen on the floor, she's injured, you know, you have no claim against that nursing home because now it's going to arbitration. That's mm-hmm. expensive. Um, you know, the people don't have the right to, to go right into trial. you got to go through the arbitration process, which can be expensive. It can lean against you. Uh, so be careful if you go in by yourself and, and you're doing that application. Look for that arb- arbitration uh, document that you're not going to sign it. And you, you have a right not to. Yeah, Danny, we we talk about DHHR quite frequently, but in terms of uh, children issues, child care, custody, mm-hmm. and the like. Uh, does elder care, does DHHR in any way impact elder care? All the time. Okay, explain. <laughs> yes, yeah. Because that's what you have to do is you make the application for assistance for a person being in a nursing home. Uh, it, it's called Medicaid. And, and so the application goes in. Your assets must be below $2,000. And if it's a husband and wife situation, you have to manage that so that the wife's assets are, are handled properly to protect them. For example, just as I said before, you know, if a husband and wife, husband's in a nursing home, you can move the assets to the wife, but you have to do it properly. You have to pr- uh, purchase what is called a Medicaid qualified annuity. And what Congress did back in probably about the 1990s, they did not want the uh, uh, at-home spouse to be impoverished. So that's why they created these laws so that we can move these assets in, in this proper form to protect them. Danny, you frequently mentioned certain things that uh, individuals should actions they should take, and you've used power of attorney and wills uh, uh, together. Uh, some folks get too confused. Would they you do very quickly explain the difference. Yeah, a, a will is when you pass, and and that's a good question because I want to follow up on something else. Bill, is uh, a will is when you pass. It does not go into effect until you pass. Uh, so many times uh, people will say, well, I want in my will that um, I, I be, um, um, you know, certain documents read or certain I want to be, um, you know, the, the um, uh, certain burial or certain things. Many times the will's not read till 36 days after, you're, after you've passed. So you never put that in a will. You know, and the interesting thing, I've I've said this many times, I don't know if I've said it on the show, Rob, but uh, if you ever want to see a funny will, is look at um, Benjamin Franklin's will. Mm -hmm. Why is that? (laughs) Because his son sat it with British. And and that first will that he wrote, (laughs) he was really uh, just... Going after his son. If if the British would have won, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> so it's, I mean, it's an interesting will just to take a look at if if you can pull it up sometime. I think it's the first one. I think he kind of scaled it down the second one. But he and his son really didn't get along, and he did not leave anything to his son in his will. During the Revolutionary well, War, they did not. After the war, they did have a reconciliation. Did they? Yeah. yeah well, Bill, I knew. Bill was there, Danny. He knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it was, I knew him well. Yeah, it was, it was not um, no. not not happy uh, situation. And and then the power of attorneys for it, you during your lifetime. Yes. And and what that means is you're allowing somebody to make decisions for you. Uh, medically and financially, because I like to put that in one document, and and uh, you're, you're saying to that person, if if I'm in the hospital, 
Uh, that person could go in the hospital and, and make medical decisions for me, uh, retrieve medical documents so I can uh, have maybe some other doctor evaluate, you know, the treatment that I'm receiving. And, and in a will or in a power of attorney, you always want to put the pro- uh, waiver of privacy because many times you go to the hospital and if you don't have that waiver of privacy, the hospital is going to say, Mm-mm. you know, in this world today, we're really concerned about privacy rights that they're not going to give up those papers. <laughs> can, can an individual do this stuff and gain this knowledge on their own, Danny, without being an attorney or going to an attorney? They can. I mean, again, you, I, I, don't, um, I don't like to encourage that. Uh-huh. I mean, I don't, want them to, to, I don't want to try to sell them anything, but just make sure you, you study, you make sure it's logical, you make sure that you have these bases covered. A lot of this information is on the Internet, but it's going to take some study. I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years. Do you know how many times I've stumbled, you know, going through all this to make sure everything's right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you just make sure if, if, it's, if you can. And it's going to take a lot of time. It does. Yeah. It does. It and, does. and how do you know what you're, what you're reading on the Internet is true anyway? I know. I know. Because <laughs> you get a lot of people out there that will put so many things out that, um, that just didn't write. It's mm-hmm. going to lead you down the wrong, you know, wrong path. You know, so... You can do it. You know, same thing with a will. You can do it. But again, make sure it's logical. I'll give you an example. I remember a lady came into my office one time and she said, uh, Staggers, I didn't need you to do my will. And and she said, here, here it is. And the first paragraph says, I hereby give will, divides and bequeath all my property to my sister. Next paragraph, she says, I hereby give will, divides and bequeath the piano to the other sister. It's illogical because she's already <laughs> yeah. given everything to the, you know, that, that front paragraph. Just Try to think, try to be logical, try to do the best, yeah. you, can, best you can. Does the and, first paragraph trump the second paragraph in that situation? It would. It yeah. would. Because you, and, and, and again, you, you can do your own will. Uh, it has to be in ha- your own handwriting. It has to be dated and signed. A lot of people say, oh, it's got to be notarized. No, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it's called a holographic will, and as long as it's in your own handwriting, uh, it will be verified when you pass, probably take it to the local bank who has a couple of tellers that can recognize your signature, yeah. verify it. It's a good will. I don't think I'd be able to read my own real if, will if I wrote it, even if I <laughs> yeah. could waken from the dead to read it again, I wouldn't be able to yeah. so, so are we talking about handwriting? Handwriting, <laughs> yeah. No, and, and that, that will you were just talking about, Danny, that for some reason, it reminded me of when George Allen was coach of the old Washington Redskins, yes. and he used to trade draft choices twice. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> well highest bitter john highest that, bitter yeah those, those were great years but, but again and you ask whether that would the first paragraph trump not maybe it doesn't but it's going to end up in a court case it may slow down in that case yeah it's going to end up in a court case because then um, one daughter's going to say i got everything mm-hmm. the other daughter's going to say wait a minute i got the piano so <laughs> just try to be logical is what i'm trying to say if you do this yourself but the going to a lawyer for will probably four, five, six hundred dollars. Yes. Going to the computer, you can do it for twenty five, thirty dollars. So there is a great temptation it just is. to download and assume everything is right. Frequently, the uh, if there are errors, it will not become apparent until it goes to probate. That's right. And then there's major difficulties at that stage. And it's very expensive. Once and you very probate, expensive. That's right. You know, and and one of the things that you hear a lot of is a lot of people. You'll see it on TV now. Oh, we can do your will. And they don't get the personal touch, the personal information that you need, you know, yeah. to do the will. It's just a computer generated thing, and it, and it really doesn't help the family. And and again, Bill, as you you know, because you've been through it, is um, once mom and dad pass, it gets contentious with the family. That as county commissioner, county councilman, uh, that was the most difficult part of yes. our job, yes. uh, trying to reconcile what was intended in the will. Yes. And you're exactly right. There's nothing more vicious than yes. family members yes. feeling there they've been slighted. Bill, why yes. would county commissioners be involved in determining a will? Because it had to be approved by probate. Yep. Interesting. I didn't. I didn't know. Yeah. That. Yeah. I the, not have known. the county commission oversees the probate yeah, office, exactly. and yeah. so the appeal process goes through the um, county council. Now county it can it can be referred to a to circuit judge, but okay. most frequently it is resolved at the county commission level. What are all the legal components of a legal will? <laughs> 
that I mean it, it's not too not too sophisticated, not too uh, in depth. You know, the person has to be competent, and the competency for a will is that you know the extent of your family and the extent of your estate, and and then you know that it has to be uh, properly um, uh, documented. You know that you've handwritten it, or you've you know you've done the will, had it typed up, signed it with two witnesses, and in, in a self-authenticating paragraph and notarized. You know, it, it's um, it's not you know it's not too sophisticated, but the problem of it is is you you got to make sure it's it's good. So if I I put it together a document, I say I hereby leave being of sound mind and body. Hereby leave this show to Bill Stubblefield. But the first part of that would be uh, challenge. Right? <laughs> <laughs> sound mind would be it would never get beyond that in probate. <laughs> there you go. See, I just tripped up on my own words. Why did you an attorney? Yeah. Yeah. I had an attorney and a doctor apparently. Yeah. And yeah. if the lawyer was looking at you, uh, he'd say apparently or conceivably or possibly of sound mind. <laughs> How about potentially? Oh, potentially, potentially. Of, of <laughs> arguably sound mind. Yeah. Danny, what else is on your list there? Yeah, just a couple of little things, and, and um, you know, it, it, it's uh, the courts do try to uphold the the um, the intent of, of the person drafting the will. They really try to look at it, make sure that will is upheld if they can find it that way. Mm -hmm. And I mean, sometimes just little notes on a scrap piece of paper can be a will, yeah. Yeah. you know, properly done. But I want to go to one other little couple little things. And, and, you know, since we're talking elders, is identity theft. I mean, that's a prevalent thing in today's world. And just an alert for people is keep your information private, your personal information. A lot of times you'll get a call on, on the phone and, you know, somebody's trying to scam you. They're, they've gotten into your Medicare card. Now, what is your Medicare card number or what is your Social Security card number? Never give those out. But, you Danny, that's great advice. But... It's not listened to by a lot of people. No. And it's, uh, if you do fall victim to a scam, uh, if the scam is from overseas, which it frequently is, there's little recourse. Is I that know. correct? That's correct. I so, mean, I don't know the different agencies you've yeah, got to contact, yeah. but you've got to do it right away. I, I mean, it's, it's just we're all vulnerable to it. I mean, I'll go through a couple things. Monitor your bank accounts. Make sure there's not some some you know some uh, suspicious check that's out there. Monitor your credit card accounts. I've had it personally. I had uh, monitoring the credit card. I noticed that uh, there was a charge on the card for some um, some some account or somebody charged it in California. Right away, you notify your credit card company and let them know. The problem there then is they give you a new card with a new number. Now you got to go back through the, yeah. all the people, you know, that you've dealt with and let them know that your mm -hmm. credit card number's been changed. Um, but again, don't give your um, don't give your social security number. Never give your Medicare card number uh, and and email. That is the one and probably the worst one. You see something and you oh that looks like that's interesting. Don't click on it. Don't click on it. Yeah. You know, and, and the other one that I've seen, too, that is um, kind of prevalent is is um, you'll get an email from, like, son, daughter, friend. I'm in London, England, and, and I've been, you know, taken advantage of, and I'm in jail or something, and they want money, and, and uh, please send it or something of that nature. You know? Don't do it. Don't do it. You just can't do it. Because they can capture your voice and then create yeah. a whole conversation. Oh, my golly, everything. It just... Uh, you just got to be careful. And that's the other thing. If these uh, crank calls or these calls that soliciting, they say it's much better just say hello and never say yes. Oh, that's true. Because they can borrow the yes that's right. and weave it into that's the right. story. Yeah. That is exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah d again, don't answer any of those type yeah. of emails. And there, I was talking to a fellow that um, handles that, and he said that's the worst problem is, you know, with the uh, scams on the emails, you see something, you click it on. Now the virus gets into all your system. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, the big companies, they have to tell their people, don't do that, because that can create a lot of problems for us. Yeah, absolutely. Ransomware. That's, we've yes. seen it locally. It's, yes. It's, it's an issue. Yes. Hey, I yes. want to go back to a question you were uh, kind of after what something you mentioned before, and that is selling your assets to qualify for federal funds. 
you mentioned something to that effect about if you're going into a nursing not into a nursing home or federal programs or whatever, maybe you have a lot of assets. You don't want your assets drained while you're in a nursing home That's or some right. type of. So, what exactly is that scenario you were describing? So, so again, you, it, it's many of the times you don't have to sell assets. You might want to. For example, if you got a second home and you really don't need it, you might want to sell that, but you're going to take the liquid assets. And again, for example, a husband and wife situation, we can do that Medicaid qualified annuity. And, and not every company can do that. You got to make sure they can. A lot of companies will tell you they can, but it's got to be irrevocable, non-assignable, and actuarially sound. Meaning actuarially sound means that it's not longer than the spouse's um, life expectancy. Mm-hmm. So, and, and the other thing is you want to get it out to the, um, you want to get it out to the wife, you know, because again, I'm using the husband in the nursing home. So that's why the annuity, you only want it maybe one, two, three years. Get an overture because once, once dad's qualified, mom can make as much money as she wants. You know, because again, Congress didn't want to inhibit her mm-hmm. from from being able to have some assets not being bankrupt. Because before that law went into effect, there were many women that were you know in in, in a dire situation. They had no money, and and so, and mm-hmm. so that's why this this went into effect. Um, and and it, again, I want to come down to a couple more points. Is um, is the recently there's um, a revenue ruling that came out and it's uh, basically it says that if you have an irrevocable trust and you've got property in that trust like real real property real estate uh and it does not go through probate you don't get to step up in basis what that means is if you buy property for a hundred dollars you sell it for two hundred dollars you got a two hundred dollar gain if it does not get the step up in basis that means the step up in basis comes about when you pass. What is the value of that property when you pass? So, so by putting real estate in an irrevocable trust, you could lose that step up in basis. And, and oh. yeah, so like the step up in basis, say the value of that property is 150 now, you sell it for 200, you only have a $50 gain. So that's, you know, a lot of times people will talk, oh, we, we want to trust. For example, a guy called me yesterday, and he was telling me that uh, his client, he was an investment person, he said, I want that real estate in in a trust. And I said, no, you don't, (laughs) because he would lose that step up in basis. Right now, with the transfer on death deed and life estate deeds, we will get a step up in basis. You know, so again, you... you, um, And this was a recent change in the law. Well, this is coming. This, this, it hasn't it, been enacted yet. It, it's a revenue ruling. So the IRS just imposed that for trust. Now, whether they come back to life estate deeds and do the same thing, I don't know. Danny Staggers, how do people get in touch with you with questions about what we discussed today and other things involving the elder care law? Sure. My name is Danny Staggers. I'm at 133 East John Street, Martinsburg, West Virginia. Phone number 304-267-3915. Good to see you again, Daniel. <laughs> it's always good to see you guys. <laughs> always get a chuckle when I come here. <laughs> but you shouldn't. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's what we're here for. <laughs> and, and, Therapeutic. And Danny, you were a superb guest host asking the guest. <laughs> he, he, he asked himself the tough question <laughs> and he's not let up on himself. And all we did was just sit back and watch in amazement. The <laughs>